Uh, I guess there's no goon introducing us, so we'll have to do everything ourselves. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I'm Dennis. A lot of you guys know me. Yay for Houston. <laughs> and, um, a lot of you know me from my previous talk. Uh, I talked about access control systems. Uh, so this is going to be my second time uh, speaking. Uh, I, I work for Alaris Consulting. I'm an adversarial engineer. My best, my most favorite title yet. Um, I am also, a, since I'm from Houston, I'm a founder of Houston Locksport, or Lock Picking Club, uh, and Houston Air Hackers Anonymous. Just a bunch of us hanging out, drinking beers, and doing micro talks in Houston. So, ooh, what do we got here? Libations for your talk. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Round of applause for Kyle. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. And so um, I'm Tim. I'm a red team manager for Lars, which means I'm, I don't know what to call Dennis uh, employee, but more of a team lead, consultant, uh, that sort of thing. This is my 10th year as a DEF CON goon, so I'm eligible for retirement now, which is always fun. Yeah, woo. Um, I'm also a former CCDC team coach for a group of college students through CCDC. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that program. I see you guys in the back. And, awesome. And uh, I'm also a former CTF participant for DEF CON. I did that two years in a row. I also ran the wireless contest for a couple of years. So I've kind of been around. I've done a little bit of everything. This is also my second DEF CON talk. So what we're going to talk about is sticky keys. If, if I say sticky keys, does everybody in here know what we're talking about? That's how you get into your computer. <laughs> exactly right. So if you Google for how to reset Windows passwords, like eight of the top ten links on Google are um, pages that tell you reboot off of your rescue CD, Go in, copy cmd.exe, over set hc.exe, reboot at the login prompt, press shift five times, use net user, change your password, close the window, log in, and you're done. There's only one or two of those sites that actually says clean up after yourself when you're done. So there's a lot of boxes out there that still have CMD replaced, or CMD replacing set hc, and these boxes are just kind of ripe for the picking. So it was used as a persistence mechanism, like there's a kernel ownage blog on it. There's several different places that tell you how to do this. Um, and with this, though, so there's no event logs that are generated whenever you actually execute this backdoor. So there's no trace that you press shift five times and you get a command prompt because it's pre-authentication. So there's two ways that you can go about backdooring a Windows box with this method. One of them is the binary replacement, actually replacing any of the pre-authentication accessibility tools with CMD or you can set the image file execution option registry debugger uh, key to be cmd.exe. And so whenever you uh, access any of the accessibility tools from within Windows, you get a command prompt uh, running as system pre-authentication. So here's a list of the accessibility tools that are available pre-authentication. You've got the binary on the left, the description of what the tool actually does in the middle, and on the right, you've got how you actually access that. And so that's going to come in important later whenever we actually start talking about the tool. But Microsoft does have some limitations on what binaries you can replace any of the accessibility tools with. So um, the first limitation is you have to have elevated access on the box. You're going to have to have administrator or system to begin with. So we're not actually exploiting the box and we're not actually um, placing a backdoor. We're just taking advantage of a backdoor that somebody else has already put on the box. The binary must be digitally signed. This is Microsoft's restriction for that. The binary must exist in System32, and it must be on the Windows protected file list. And so if you've ever ran System File Checker and it goes back and says, hey, look, these binaries have been replaced or there's something wrong with them, and it fixes them, that's the Windows protected file list. And you can get a list of those um, from Microsoft's website. But so you can't just use any old binary. You have to use something that meets those criteria, and CMDDXE meets all three of those criteria. And so we were working with an incident response team in an organization, and they had uncovered via the file system side of things several boxes that had uh, this persistence mechanism put in place. And so it was more than likely a systems administrator, could have been a, a rogue admin, could have been some APT group that was in the environment. Don't know how they actually got there, but um, we wanted something to where we could scan for this from the network side. So um, we started, a, well, let me back up a little bit. The problem with looking for binaries that have been replaced on the disk is you don't actually catch the image file execution option unless you're sweeping the registry as well. You're going to miss any unmanaged boxes, so boxes that the group doesn't have administrative access on. You're going to miss any, uh, any boxes that they don't have administrative privileges. Um, and so we had a need for a network-based scanner. We started looking into writing our own using Java RDP or looking at Python and had a bunch of problems and just a hate for Java that we couldn't get over. So we ran across Zach Grace's proof of concept strip script, Sticky Key Hunter. Um, Sticky Key Hunter was a great starting point for us. It gave us um, a, a, a decent framework for how we wanted to kind of implement our script. But 
his script was similar to the Peeping Tom program. If any of you are pen testers and you've seen Peeping Tom, it scrapes a bunch of websites and will take screenshots of them and then give you a page that you can just scroll through looking at them. And so if you're talking about a large organization with uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to 100,000 endpoints, that's a lot of screenshots just to scroll through looking for a command prompt. So we wanted a way to, to automate some of that for us. And so um, Zach's script also in the to-dos had automatic command prompt detection and then multi-threading to make a script faster. It took about 25 to 30 seconds per host and we did some optimizations on that. All right, so we started with uh, the Sticky Key Hunter script that we, we you know, Tim talked about uh, and we went into it just, we, w we wanted to help improve it and help kind of complete its to-do items uh, and what ended up happening is I, I spent way too much time on it just seeing things that I wanted to do differently and so we ended up more than double uh, the lines of code of what it, what it originally was and we implemented a, a lot of performance improvements, uh, some error handling to help with, you know, when, if hosts go down or whatever, uh, lots of detailed logging to help with reporting uh, and as well as it's now parallelized so you, it'll scan more than one host at a time and that dramatically improves the time it takes to scan a list, a, a range of hosts or IPs. Uh, and it also automatically alerts on command prompts or, uh, on hosts it thinks it actually found a command prompt on. Uh, and so you don't have to scroll through thousands and thousands of, uh, of screenshots. Uh, and of course it's in Bash so it's tailored toward Linux. We programmed this on Kali Linux. Uh, yeah, all the tools you'll need uh, is available for Kali. So um, that's our script. So let me demo this for you. I'm going to start, I'm going to start by demoing uh, what Tim talked about, what's the stick, uh, what the, what the sticky keys vulnerability is. So I'm going to remote desktop into uh, a computer and just show you what happens. It's, you're going to see a Windows login prompt and we're not going to put in any credentials. We're just going to be presented with that login prompt. Uh, and this, this uh, computer is vulnerable to the sticky key uh, backdoor. So all we do is press shift five times. I'm going to do this. There you go. And then now you see we have a command prompt and because this is spawning from winlogon.exe, you can see who am I? We are system, the highest level access you can get on that computer. And so that's a, just a, a method of persistence, a backdoor that lots of people do. Uh, and so our script, let's go back to the PowerPoint here, our script automates searching for that, automates actually scanning for that vulnerability. Uh, you'll see here, let's press play carefully, does that, does that work? Okay, so it's going, so you'll see it's named banana.sh. Well, when we recorded this, I had no idea what to name it, so Tim and I settled on banana, but uh, now it's sticky key slayer, so. Uh, but you can see, I've, I told it to do eight threads at a time, it's doing a host of like 20 something hosts, a uh, list of 20 something hosts, and it's going through each one, it's establishing a connection to it, it's taking screenshot, hitting shift five times, as well as other keyboard shortcuts, taking another screenshot, and then comparing the amount of black pixels that are on the screen, and it'll alert, okay, I found a lot of black pixels, it's within this range of this percentage and this percentage, I think you have a command prompt. And once it's done, you can see the logging there, I hope the text is not too small. Uh, you can look through the screenshots, and you see the screenshots of all the hosts that don't have a command prompt, and in that discovered folder that I'm gonna click on in a second, you'll see all the hosts that actually have a command prompt and you can see them in there. Uh, there's one of them. So to reiterate, there's, there's a sticky key slayer, that's the real name, specify dash jh for the number of jobs, demo host is just a list of targets line by line, uh, and then you get the screenshots for all the computers, uh, and in the discover folder, there's the ones that actually have command prompt, and there it is. And those are computers we have full system level remote code execution on without any work, using someone else's back door. Uh, so free, free money. So uh, tool usage, so that, that, I mean that's the tool, that's, that's the gist of it, it's like 360 lines of code, but that's all it does. Um, stick, sticky key, excuse me, tool usage, sticky key slayer, dot sh. So there's a, a few um, uh, parameters that you can choose. You can do dash v for verbose, it does output uh, some information to you, but you can make it more verbose if you want to, maybe something's wrong or you, you just want more information. Uh, you can specify the number of jobs. Uh, it defaults one job at a time, but you can give it as much as you want, uh, as much as your CPU can handle. Don't try a thousand because it will crash. Uh, but I have, I've had success on a Kali VM running on a MacBook Pro, about 24. Uh, and that'll scan about 22,000 hosts in about three hours. So that's pretty good. Uh, timeout, you, you guys are familiar with the concept of the timeout. It'll, it'll try a certain job for a certain amount of time before it just errors out. You can specify that timeout, it defaults to 30 seconds. And then target list, you can either give it a single target, an IP or a host or a, or a 
at QDN, or you can give it a list of hosts. Uh, and that's, that's the money right there. You, you can give it a list of 20,000 hosts, let it run, go home, come back, and get all these, get hundreds of, oh, sorry, 20,000 screenshots uh, when you come back. So some limitations to the tool. Uh, it does tie up the computer you're using. Uh, as you can see, it was popping up a bunch of remote desktop windows, uh, and so it's kind of hard to use it when you're, when you're uh, it's hard to use a computer when you're using the script. So have a VM dedicated just to that for, for that time. Um, and uh, as well as we, <laughs> when Tim and I were doing some scans on some other IP addresses, with their permission, um, wink, uh, we found that ma the majority of them, majority of the backdoors were cmd.exe, however there were a few that were something else like task manager or MMC or something, you know, custom. And our script of course doesn't detect those because it's looking for a certain amount of black pixels. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future, we're, we're, Tim and I are kind of working on how we're going to engineer that, engineer like detecting an, any anon anomalous behavior, not just CMD. Uh, statistics. All right, so um, based on Dennis and I's assessments and then based on some assessments from some other friends and other things, we've probably scanned about half a million boxes. Um, we've turned these over to some large organizations for internal scanning and there's a pretty decent success rate internally for some of the, some of the environments that we were in. But we decided to turn around and look at a large business class ISP. I went to Shodan, did a search for business ISP, and then uh, port 3389, got a list of boxes that were exposed, that were exposing RDP to the internet, and there were about 100,000 or so roughly in that list. Um, we had 570 system shells by the time the scan was done. It took about six or eight hours to scan that large of an IP space. So that was one out of every, uh, the real statistic was like one out of every 173 boxes. One out of every 175 makes a great round number for it. But that was far more boxes than we thought were actually going to be vulnerable to a backdoor that's been around for years. I mean, our, our first step into this was this is going to be stupid. Nobody's ever going to do this. And it turns out this is happening all over the place. So by looking at the domain names on the login screen, there's educational institutions, there's law offices, manufacturing facilities, hospitals, um, pretty much any vertical that you can think of have free system shells on their boxes. So if you step into an assessment and environment, if you're doing an, ex an external test and they have RDP enabled, hey, take a shot, it may work. If you're internal, that's even better because you may find one or two servers, but those one or two servers you've got a system shell on that you can now run Mimikatz or go from there with absolutely no logging. By the way, that's 570 plus shells we got, like, with no work required. How is that not worth a round of applause? <laughs> All right, so now we gotta talk about what matters most, right? The recommendations, the remediation, the prevention detection. So we have a lot of, we've worked a lot on, on, on the remediation side of this. So we came up with a, a, a few techniques, a few uh, just, just ways to, to, to help mitigate this. So uh, if you do find uh, one of these, uh, one of your boxes in your environment are vulnerable to this back door, there are a few things you can do. You can delete the executable. If there's, if, if CMD was replaced, asset.hd.dc or any one of those other uh, accessibility tools, you can just simply delete them. Uh, they're not n totally necessary to make your computer function uh, and your computer will eventually in an update or when it does an integrity check, it'll, uh, it'll replace those files back to where it'd be. Um, if you don't want to delete them, you can force an integrity check. You can use sfc.exe, which is system file checker that's built into Windows and what that'll do is that'll uh, scan all the Windows protected files in which all of these are Windows protected files and it'll check are these the files that they're supposed to be. If not, it'll replace them back to what they're supposed to be. So you can run FSC scan now, you can specify to do the, all, your entire drive or specific files. Um, if, if this was done through the registry method using the debugger to make it run, uh, you can simply delete that registry key. That key does not need to be there. Uh, delete the whole key for setht.exe or utilman or whatever. Um, and one thing I like to, to, to inform people is that I, I really feel that they should treat this as an indicator of compromise. If they find, if you guys find this backdoor in your environment, it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be someone subverted processes uh, and put this backdoor in for whatever reason. Maybe, the, maybe it's just a, a simple reason they wanted to get in in case something goes wrong or maybe it's they wanted to get in when they get fired. Um, so there's that and then there's also, it, if it's not that reason, it's an indicator of compromise. Maybe there is a, a, an intrusion in your network previously, some malware or APT as they call it or some threat actor 
Oh, great. Someone laughed at APT. I laugh, too, every time. Uh, someone, someone did this. Uh, th this. This is a known method of persistence. I mean, this is my top method. When I go to CCDC, I played against that guy over there. Uh, we, we, I mean, we wrecked them with just cmd.exe backdoor because, you know, they, they took a snapshot of their VMs before, you know, after we already implemented this backdoor. So we were able to get in every time. Um, so treat this as an indicator of compromise because it's serious. It's not, it doesn't just happen. Um, now going into the prevention detection phase, okay, the simple protection, simple way to protect against this is restrict local admin, of course. You need to be local admin to replace these files. So restricting that is important. It, 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 it helps resolve a lot of issues, including this. Uh, full disk encryption, that'll help prevent if someone were to steal a laptop and get content, access the contents to the hard drive and replace the files that way. Uh, full disk encryption will help protect against that. Uh, my favorite um, method of, pro it doesn't really protect against it, it protects against the exploitation of it, is network level authentication for remote desktop. Uh, network level authentication, uh, if when that's enabled, it requires valid credentials before a console is ever presented to the user. So our script wouldn't work unless we had valid credentials. So enabling NLA uh, across your entire environment is a valid protection against exploitation of this, against remote exploitation. Uh, endpoint monitoring, we've seen a lot of success with endpoint monitoring. You can uh, monitor a few things, one of them being monitor when the file is replaced. Uh, if the file is something what it's not supposed to be, alert on that. You can also alert on if CMD ever spawns from the win logon process, as a child of the win logon process, that's not normal. I mean, in my, in my experience, it's usually not normal, so you can flag on that as well. Um, and then NetFlow analysis, simply look at, are there hosts, is there one host or a few hosts in the environment that are just spraying RDP port 3389 everywhere? If so, maybe you should look into that. So, oh, by the way, Tim made this for me, it's great. This is, uh, what do you call it? The, the what, what do you call it? Conquest, the ears of your enemies. The ears of my enemy. Uh, the rumor has it, these are all the shift keys that we've broken over time from exploiting them, so we just took them off and Tim made them into a necklace, so I'm gonna wear it. Um, what's this guy? So, a little treat for you guys. The code is, has been released as of an hour ago, so it's on my GitHub, Sticky Key, excuse me, Sticky Key Slayer. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Sticky Key Slayer. Um, it's, it's up there. It's, uh, uh, there. I put a lot of documentation. Hopefully it's, it's easy to, to read and easy to use. I recommend if you guys work for a big company or a small company, download it. Look at the code so you know I'm not doing anything malicious. Uh, <laughs> don't just download any code and run it. But, uh, uh, I mean, you can if you want. I don't care. Um, <laughs> run this in your environment uh, and, and just see. You know, you'll be surprised how many you'll see out there. We, there. There hasn't been any environment yet that we've scanned and haven't at least found one. So try it. You know, look into it and see what you can get. Um, uh, so, yeah, my, my code's on GitHub. I, I encourage you guys to contribute to it or, or at least report any issues you see because I always like to make my stuff work for everyone. So report issues, send us feedback, whatever you want. Slides are also online. Demo videos online if you care about it. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Questions? So we're... Um We've also got a weaponized version in the works that you can just say execute this code as soon as you find a command prompt. So you just set it and forget it and watch the shells rain in. So that's a... Uh... I call it raining shells.sh. <laughs> Question. Question over there. Oh. Uh, you, we'll repeat the question. Yeah, yell. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, questions go up here. So we have yeah, you, three minutes for questions. You and need then, a loud mouth in the back. Yeah, I'm sure you have questions. Um, okay, go ahead. Is it on? Okay, just tell me. I'll repeat it. All right. So if if you use black pixels to determine if you got a command prompt, uh, what did you do to 
account for the different operating systems. For example, Windows XP has a pure black background and other operating systems might use dark backgrounds. Uh, so it's the difference between the, uh, whenever we make an initial RDP connection, we take a screenshot and whenever we make a, um, actually send all the accessibility options, we take a difference, uh, take a second screenshot and it's the difference between the two. It's not just looking for black pixels, it's looking for the different, um, uh, the difference between them. So if you look at like Dell has uh, their default Windows uh, install, has the front end of the Dell bezel on it that's got a lot of black in it. Yeah. Whenever you actually pop a sticky key shell on it, it, um, it, it, there's more black on the screen than there was before. And so we're just looking for the difference. It's very simple. It's rudimentary. Um, there's been some work out there in like OpenCV trying to do screenshot detections and other stuff for it. Uh, we looked into using OCRing the screen, but we found a lot of boxes in non-native English, and I don't know how to do OCR recognition in English in non-English char uh, character sets. So. Um, the about half a million IP addresses that we've scanned with it from us and then other people's engagements, uh, it's great, it's like 99.96% um, effective in detecting the screenshot every time. There were a couple of false positives, but those false positives were due to broken consoles to where like the top two thirds of the screen was the actual console, the bottom third of the screen would just be black. Thank you. Woo! Uh, yeah, I mean, so to, to, to paralyze this, we do use a GNU Parallel, did I say that right? GNU Parallel. We use the tool GNU Parallel and that just allows uh, the script to spawn itself in multiple processes and just run really, really fast. So it's really cool looking to that tool. Question? I think it was first. Question. Um, do you have a list of all of the other ones that work? Because yeah, you said there are other ones. But you only talked about set HC. There you go. Ha ha. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> so just to reiterate, this is a not, so shift five times is only one of the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven executables that'll work with this. Uh, window key U will op open util man, uh, on screen keyboard. Uh, there's, a, there's no keyboard shortcut for that, but there's an option for that. Um, and so they're saying we're done. We have one more minute. Question, one more minute. Yeah, sure. So if you can programmatically scan and detect these things and you can programmatically send keys, you could also, in theory, programmatically add an option to remove the back door. Yes. Or add dash dash evil and add your own implant and then remove that back door. So, so my goal as a troll was if you just downloaded our code and, ran, code and ran it and said, hey, go ahead and just do this, is to run SFC slash scan now as the actual um, weaponized code. And then drop us something in the log file to say, hey, um, there, this box had this backdoor enabled on it, but sorry, you just cleaned it. Thanks. Read the All code right. next time. So thank you guys so much. Questions will, will be out there, and we'll slowly move to the bar. Thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs>